And people would often try to base their arguments and uh, try to derive them to geometry. Um, it's kind of a funny anecdote, but um, Karl Marx and, and Frederick Engels, uh, when, they, when they were writing their kind of their texts, they actually tried to reduce what they were saying to mathematics because they felt like if they could prove what, there's, what the system they were advocating in terms of mathematics, then people would have to accept it. Um, but what happens if mathematics itself is inconsistent? If you get paradoxes, like the set theory paradoxes, or you get these possible interpretations where things are sometimes true or not true, what, what happens then if, if mathematics is not on short footing? Um, and this is kind of a, a problem which I, I want you guys to just think about as we, as we move along to this book. And what does it mean to provide an interpretation and things like that? So what I want us to do is take a, a quick break because we're going to go into one of my favorite dialogues. And you'll see the purpose of, of this food later. But because it's a long dialogue, I want everyone to kind of take a break and get some food and drink. And uh, we'll, we'll then read the dialogue. But I'll need some volunteers for reading. So let's go ahead and take like a, a five minute break and before we start reading, OK? So, a Little Harmonic Labyrinth, what do you guys think? Confusing. confusing. Why do you say it's confusing? It's, a, it's switch roles in between the stones. So, in what way do you mean roles? It's like the turtle becomes the kills and the kills becomes the turtle. So, there's role flipping yeah. in, in terms of like the way they treated each other? Or? It's like the, the characters get funny. Ah, OK. Yeah, so, and more interestingly, though, there was they had an opportunity to do that by kind of constantly going down to nested roles of, and they could kind of essentially be new people in some ways. So that's good. Does anyone else have? Oh, get Sandra. They talk about themselves in some of the Right. So we had this weird playing around with levels, like, uh, and in some ways that was kind of hard to capture perfectly in terms of audio. But I, I'm sure most of you saw as we were reading along that there was indentations. Um, in, the, in the text, and that kind of was a visual reminder as you're reading what level of the story you were on, at. And, you, and Douglas Hofstadter used all sorts of really nice tricks where you would have like a character's like, oh, I think, I think, he, means, I think he means tonic. And he, they would be talking up here on level, level one, and you know, down on, on level two, uh, they would say, oh, you know, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, yes, tonic is exactly what I needed. Even though, um, in, in this in this situation, these guys don't really know about their higher levels of reality. It's just like the same question of what happened to the weasel when here he was sitting in our everyday normal life and he took some popping tonic, and he popped up to a higher level of reality. Like, and it kind of makes you wonder. And uh, I know for me, I always get the visual image of of you know playing the universe kind of as 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 a fractal, and. Um, you know, we spend all our time living down in this corner. We spend all our time living down in this corner of the Sierpinski casket, and then one day somebody takes a popping tonic, and suddenly, like, holy mackerel! There's there's actually all these levels. Um, and then just the fact that you've had that one experience of of playing around with two levels of reality, it makes you speculate. Of um, well, why aren't there? Why can't there be more? Why can't there be kind of an infinite set of realities? And how do I know what mine is? And um, you know, th there's something I, w I want us to kind of go ahead and just bring out into the open here. Um, and it's the idea that when I first started this class, and on the first lecture, I know not all of you were here, um, I said the fundamental thing we want to answer at the end of this course is what is an I? What makes something conscious from unconscious things? How do we get particles and atoms to start talking about themselves like the way we do? Um, so fundamentally, in this class, we're going to be talking about a lot of really kind of deep and profound questions. Um, and I want everybody to not feel afraid that, or that their, their opinion might be kind of persecuted. Because even in this story, we, we, we managed to meet God during the middle of this dialogue. Um, and if we can't talk about God, like, it's going to really n narrow what we're allowed to talk about. So, um, and similarly, when I'm saying, you know, what is the mind? How do we get? 
you know, a physical brain to, to then start operating in a, uh, with mental and conscious thoughts, like that's very fundamentally asking questions about the soul and um, what you guys' opinions are on that become important. And I, and I don't want to feel like anybody is you know, learning in a hostile environment. So I encourage you guys to speak actively. Um, it's interesting because uh, Douglas Hofstadter presents a very uh, unique picture of, of God, right? He picks uh, this kind of recursive idea of a stack of infinities. Um, and uh, just a, as a kind of an, an anecdote, and this is actually a little historical fact for you, um, the Jesuits, right around the time of the development of calculus, you know, we, had, we kind of had Isaac Newton and Leibniz and these guys doing, doing their stuff in, in the 1670s, maybe a little later, but it really took everyone else into like the 1730s. Um, Newton, Leibniz, for these guys to develop the calculus, you know, studying the infinitesimally small. Remember, when we're playing around with calculus, uh, we, we're asking what happens when we kind of approximate a function originally in a finite way, and then what happens is we take the limit to something which is infinitely small. And what does that mean? And when you, when you start playing around with calculus, uh, you can find out, find the things like the area under the curve, and the way you approximate this is you know with kind of these blocks and taking infinitely small limits. The Greeks, they they were really close to developing the calculus. Archimedes was in many ways conceptually just a few stone throws away from it, um, but the Greeks were also much smarter than Newton and Leibniz because they said, well. Dumbos, when you take a bunch of infinitely small things, you can't get something finite, right? Like, how is it that I can take a bunch of two-dimensional circles, which are infinitely thin, and then stack them on top of each other in order to get, you know, a, a cylinder? It doesn't make sense. It does not make sense. Um, so really, what happened here, and then getting into Euler and these guys, is they essentially were trying to take our concepts of the infin infinite and making them rigorous. And the reason why I go on this is that the Jesuits, um, around this time and getting later, were one of the very first groups and schools to start teaching their students calculus because they felt that if they understood mathematically and rigorously and they could deal with concepts of the infinite, they had a better understanding of God. So the Jesuits deeply felt that you know you understanding calculus was essential to you understanding God. Um, and I think this very much goes it goes in spirit with the uh, little harmonic labyrinth, where, where we kind of, you saw this, this image of, uh, of, of God over jinn, and jinn is actually an Arabic word for, for genie. Um, and then, you know, this going off to God itself, and then coming back. Um, so this really requires wrestling some of the conceptual tools behind dealing with the infinite. Um, and it's not something I can teach you fully in this class, but I encourage you all to pursue it. Um, quick question. You'll notice that the, each of the genies did it in half the amount of time that it took the previous genie. Can anyone tell me why? Or at least why Hofstadter went ahead and paid attention to that detail? Because you don't want to do it forever. Okay, so you need something. And Felix, go ahead. Great, one moment. Right, okay, so the amount of time it took was one plus a half of, of one genie's time plus half of the previous genie's time plus, yes, and so on. Um, yes, sorry. Knew that it wasn't right. <laughs> one sixteenth, missed a term. Dot, dot, dot. And do you know what this equals? OK, there you go. We, we got some winners. So this is actually an example of a geometric progression.